Are you ready? Yeah. You may be seated. First Corinthians is where you need to go in your Bible. First Corinthians chapter 12. First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27. Now, <laughs> I like immediacy, don't you? Now, look at your neighbor and say, you don't have to wait. That's immediacy. Now, nothing else has to happen. No more blood has to be shed. No more blood running down a naked side, dripping off his toes into bloody pools on the earth. Not one more angel has to be sent. Not one more prophecy. No, not one more sermon to be preached. Not one more song to be sung. Not one organ riff to be run. Now. But God, some of you look like you need some now. Now you are the body of Christ and members, shout the last word. The Holy Spirit created you to be you. Now just, just lay your hand on your forehead and say, I'm going to get happy tonight. Be in me. Somebody got to get comfortable in their own skin. Somebody's got to feel good about who you are. Thank God you're not who you used to be. Let's, let's not talk about that because if we began to talk about your real testimony, you'd start counting ceiling tiles or looking under your shoe. God created you with uniqueness. I like that. Otherwise, everybody would be as handsome as me. Why is that funny? <laughs> look at somebody next to you, look them square in the eye and say this with me. Regardless of how terribly strange you are, I need you to complete my miracle. So straighten up and listen up and let's get busy. First Corinthians chapter 12 verse 7 in the message Bible each person is given something to do that shows who God is. <laughs> That'd make a hillbilly boy happy. That God hadn't left you out. Think about that one statement. What a glory. What a power. What a revelation that I am given something to do that to a skeptical, doubting, depressed, depraved, dying, destitute horde of humanity. God is about to use me to show who he is. You don't believe that? No, you don't believe that. I can tell the way you're looking at me with your halos so crooked on your horns. You don't believe that. Do you believe that in your uniqueness, we ought to celebrate that. We ought to celebrate our diversity. You should be glad you're not like me. I should celebrate your uniqueness that you're not like me. You should be excited that you're not like me and that I'm not like you. God has given every single one of us something to do. I got to say a thing. You don't need a pulpit a microphone and an organ to show who God is. Woo. Each person is giving something to do that shows who God is. Everybody gets in on it and everybody benefits. These gifts, these callings are irreversible and unchangeable. 
There are things that God has uniquely placed in your life that are without repentance. Romans eleven twenty nine 29, for the gifts and the calling of God, I love that word, are irrevocable. I dare you to stomp your feet on the ground as if to say, devil, you can't get what God gave me. Oh, I'm talking to preachers somewhere that have been discouraged and given up. I'm talking to folks that church folk have hurt and you sat down and you feel like your gift isn't going to be used anymore. Can I tell you, everything God placed in your life is irrevocable. God gave them to you. They're gifts. There's nothing you can do to work to obtain them. Throw your hands up and shout, thank you for the gifts. This doesn't come because you're more holy than somebody else or you read the Bible more than somebody else or you held your head just right when you prayed. These are irrevocable gifts of the Holy Spirit. Think about it as a Christmas tree. When you go out and cut your Christmas tree, it's hanging full of pine cones. That's fruit. But when you bring it in your house and you put lights on it, and you turn on the energy, that's a gift to that tree. Can I tell you right now that God has already adorned you with gifts flowing and issuing over the sapphire sill of heaven's gate into your life that distinguish you. You're decorated like no one else. <sighs> Miss Joni can do a Christmas tree, I'm here to tell you. You walk in my house, she's got a Christmas tree 22 feet high. I know I have to put it up. 22 feet high. And she does it just for me and she decorates it. She puts deer antlers in it. Only my wife could adorn a Christmas tree with deer antlers. And it looks beautiful. And then you go into my son's room and there's another tree. Everybody has a tree at our house. You go into my son's room, there's a tree. And on that tree, every year she changes it. Whatever things he's into at the time, she adorns that tree with it. She's already got Ashton's tree out. Ashton's away at college for her first year in the university, and Joan is missing her so bad, she's already got her Christmas tree out. And she's adorning it with, with ornaments that have, have come from that university. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. When you see Ashton's tree, you know it's for her. And when you see my tree, you know it's for me. And when you see Austin's tree, you know it's for him. And none of them look alike. But here's the important point. Not only do you see the uniqueness that we have, you see the love that my wife has. And can I tell you that's the same love and caring that Jesus has for you. He's not going to decorate you like anybody else. He's going to give you gifts that distinguish you and make you different than everybody else in the world I think you ought to celebrate how much God loves you now these gifts and callings are without repentance they are irrevocable but the, although they are gifts and you can't do anything to get them you can do things to amplify them they can be amplified by nurture and by development. How many of you think that something God gave you is worth developing? Uh, three of you. The rest of you are writing. I understand. They can be amplified. Some people go through their whole life and never ever recognize their gifts. They can't celebrate them. They can't enhance them because they don't know what they are. I love this. Watch this now. This is a kingdom change, not a change in gifts. <sighs> Your old sin nature passed away. Say, thank God. 
2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if any one of you be in Christ, he is a new creation. Let me give you the PRP translation of the new creation. You are a new species of being that has never existed before. Think of that. A new species of being that has never existed before. Old things are passed away and all things are become new. John 3, 3 says that you are born from above. The motivational gifts that you have been given by God remain intact when you get born again, but must be used to serve God and benefit others rather than yourself. Now you didn't, I'm not sure that you got what I said, so let me break it down just a little bit for you. Here's what I'm telling you. The gifts that are in your life after you were born again are the same gifts that were in your life before you got born again. The problem is you used them before to serve yourself and now you're in a different kingdom where everything is diametrically opposed and mutually exclusive to everything in the kingdom that you came out of. And God says, now we have, we have had a transformation. It's not that, okay, I'm born again now, so God gave me these gifts. You've had them since the doctor slapped your fanny and you went to screaming out. God uniquely gifted you. 1 Corinthians 7 17. But as God has distributed to each one, as the Lord has called each one, so let him walk. Let each one remain in the same calling which he was called. In other words, do you see it? You're going to remain with the same giftings, but now you're going to begin to use them to serve others rather than serving yourself. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. All of my life, I'm the worst person in the world to be in a room with one-on-one -on -one or in a small group. I'm introverted and quiet and I don't know what to say, but give me a crowd. I said, give me a crowd. It was the same way all my life. There was a brief period of time when I was in high school where I had, I, had, I had walked away in some degree from the things of God. And I wasn't mean, but I was ornery. And I could barely talk to you like this. But one day I decided, how I wonder what it would be like if at two minutes after 12, everybody in this school closed their books, put their pencils down, and every single student in this entire high school walked out of the building. We have educators on the front row. Coach Jack Johnson, I was in study hall at the time. Coach Jack Johnson was my study hall teacher. And all of a sudden, at two minutes after 12, just as I had told them, <laughs> every single child in that high school laid down their books, laid down their pencils, got out, up out of their desk, walked outside the building, got in their cars, and started driving a circle around the school. That's leadership. You see, I have it now, and I had it then. But I must use it for something different now, you understand. You don't have to quit your job and start working at the church when you get born again. Rather, use your God-given abilities for his glory right there where you are. Ephesians 6, 7 through 9 with goodwill doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free, and you masters do the same things to them, giving up threatening, knowing that your own master also in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. What does it say? Go ahead and do what you've always been doing, but recognize now you are not on a self-assignment, you are on a kingdom assignment. Whether it is in your home, whether it is in business, 
whether it's in the arts, entertainment, whether it's in the media, whether it's in education, whether it's in government, wherever you are, use those gifts. Become familiar with who God made you to be. Let me give you the three greatest areas of learning. And until you are educated in all three, you have no education. Are you ready? Number one, Philippians 3.10. That I may know him. The first area of knowledge you have to become proficient in is to know him. And to know him in the power of his resurrection and in the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. Faith is nothing more than a knowledge of God. Can I slow down or you want me to hurry through this? You're not sure. I was just going to tell you a story about my pastor and mentor for 15 years, Dr. Lester Sumrall. Can I tell you a story? It was the first time he was ever at our church. He had received a scripture from the Lord that said, Behold, when I am old and gray-headed, I will go forth and show this generation your strength until you come. So he was calling around the country finding young pastors. He was nearly 80 years of age at the time. And God just sent him on a mission to be in young pastors' churches. And he called me and asked, do I have to quit at 8 o'clock? I don't? Well, why are you distracting me? <laughs> and, and it was the first time Brother Sumrall was ever at our church. And we had to set up his tape table outside and a wind gust came along, blew the whole thing over. I took him to get a steak. And I was apologizing to him. I said, I said I'm sorry, Brother Sumrall. I, I, I apologize. I, I need more faith. I, I need more faith to, so our building will be bigger and we'll have a place to put your tape table. And he just went, hmm, and kept eating that rare steak. I learned after a while to, to interpret those hmms. Each one meant a different thing. He looked up at me. And he said, you don't need more faith. Now, if I was a smart Bible college student like some of you, I would have said, oh, of course I don't need more faith. I know what faith is. I, in fact, I have committed Mark eleven twenty two to 24 to memory. Have faith in God for very life, saying to you, whosoever is in this mountain, be thou removed, thou cast and see, shall not doubt in his heart, believe those things, just, shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he have. therefore what things ever you desire, when you pray, believe you receive them, you shall have them. <laughs> but since he had already preached the gospel in Chiang Kai-shek's China, in Hitler's, in Hitler's Germany, in Stalin's Russia, Cast the devil out of one girl in Billy Bid prison. 150,000 people were born again. I thought maybe he knew a little bit more about faith than I did. He said, you don't need more faith. And I said, no, sir, you're absolutely right. I don't. He said, would you like me to tell you what faith is? <laughs> yes. I mean, we're talking about a man that never took an aspirin tablet for over 50 years. We're talking about a man that kissed one woman, married her, and then buried her after 50 years of marriage. We're talking about a man that alcohol never passed over his lips. We're talking about a man that walked as a giant on the earth. And he's asking little old me if I'd like to know what faith is. And if you'll come back next Wednesday night, I'll tell you what he told me. You don't want it bad enough. I'm not going to tell you. No, no, I'm not going to tell you. You can't beg it out of me now. He said, faith is simply knowing God. Do you know our problem? We know about God. I just freaked you totally out. What most of us have is a knowledge of somebody else's revelation of God. 
Don't you think it's time to be as Moses and climb into the mountain of God or like Jacob to grasp hold of God and declare, I will not let you go until you bless me. I want to know you as David panted for the water brook. <laughs> so my soul longs not after what you can do for me. I'm not longing after my healing. I'm not longing after my blessing. I'm not longing after my joy. I'm not longing after my peace. As the deer panted for the water brook, so my soul longs after you. You're what gets me up. In the middle of the night, I chase you. I chase you in my dreams. I chase you in visions. I chase you. I, I follow your scent. I have to know you. I have to know what makes you happy, Holy Spirit. I have to know what grieves you. I, I have to know what makes you joyful. I, I have to know what makes you unable to work. I have to know what releases you. I have to know what gives you joy. And I have to know what gives you pain. I have to know you. Not about you. The second realm of knowledge after knowing God is to know your fellow man. The problem, the problem that creates problems with people is that people refuse to know and understand other people. And they, 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 they live in a parallel universe where everybody thinks like them. And then they become disquieted and discontented and confused when they see other people that don't think quite like them. And so then they segment themselves off and try to only be around people that think like they think. Number three, the third realm of knowledge. Number one, to know God. Number two, to know your fellow man. Number three, did they already put it up? No, they did. I was, gonna, I was gonna quiz you on it, but they already put it up there. Number three is what? To know yourself. And we don't know ourselves. James 1, 23, for if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man beholding his natural face in a glass, and then he goes away, your Bible says, and forgets what manner of man he is. Can I tell you, far too often, we forget who we are. I can't get no help in this Presbyterian church right here. I said, we forget who we are. And that's the reason God gave you that book. And sometimes you got to grab yourself by the nap of the neck and throw yourself up in front of that book when you feel like the tail and tell yourself that you are not the tail, you are the head. And when you feel downtrodden, you got to grab yourself by the nap of the neck, throw yourself up in front of the mirror of that word and remind yourself who you are. Yeah. Woo. Yeah. I'm going to take a minute and let you remind yourself who you are. Somebody on the front row, y'all supposed to be saved and sanctified, Holy Ghost filled, fire baptized. Somebody stand up and tell me who you are. Just tell, just tell me, tell me who you are, Elder. I'm the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. I'm over, and not going under. I'm the strongest. I'm, I'm not weak. I'm okay, that's enough. Yeah, tell me who you are, Elder. Come on, tell me. I have authority in the earth. Thank God I'm born of God. I'm born of above. I'm saved and sanctified and on my way to heaven. Somebody tell me who you are. I need some woman with fire in her belly to tell me who. Stand up, Sylvia. Get up. Tell me who you are. I'm a daughter of the living God. I have the living power of God. 
God inside me. I'm the anointed woman of God. I'm an anointed woman on this earth. I am the redeemed of the living God in the name of Jesus. And the devil has beneath my feet. And I am in power and authority in this earth. And no devil from hell can come against me because I'm his daughter and his alone. And I've been set apart for him. And no weapon formed against me shall prosper. And every tongue that rises up against me in judgment I shall condemn. For this is the heritage of the children of the Lord and my righteousness is of him. Behold, he has given me power over all devils and to cure diseases and nothing shall by any means harm me. He gives me power to tread upon serpents and scorpions. Sit down. You can't be truly educated until you understand and have a knowledge of God, a knowledge of others, and a knowledge of yourself. Motivational gifts make you unique and will help you understand who you really are. And when you're motivated in certain areas and you realize it, then you can energize yourself through it. These gifts can't be changed. They can be developed. You need to look for ways to exercise your gifts. Hallelujah. I may not look like much outside. You can spend all your time exercising yourself physically and I'll spend mine exercising myself spiritually. I know my gifts and I work them until I passed another one of our athletic teams here at Harvest Prep this week and I slapped him and said, oh, I'm sore. I said, are you sore? He said, yeah, sore. I said, good. When you stay sore, I know that you're working yourself. Hallelujah. And sometimes you're spiritually sore. Do you understand why? Because you've been working yourself. And here's the thing. You can crucify this hand. You can crucify those feet. But you got this hand waving out here. And God give you somebody to help crucify. You need to watch other people around you with similar gifts. You need to study them. You need to see their godly example. Watch others. Watch others. Watch others. Now listen, it did not say imitate others. Watch others who have similar gifts and follow their godly example. Hallelujah. Remember your leaders. Hebrews 13, 7 says, remember your leaders. Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Remember those who spoke the word to you when you knew nothing. I love this part. And considering the outcome of their way of life. I got to talk to Bible college students. It didn't say consider the way he preaches and moves a crowd. It didn't say consider the way he shouts and moves and watch people fall down under the power. It didn't say watch how cancers disappear. It didn't say watch the crowds that he moves in. Watch the prowess and the power that he exhibits. It said watch his life. Considering the conduct of their life. Considering the conduct of their life. Imitate their faith I just love that because it's not all about ministry it's right down there where you live I walked in one day Joni was standing at the kitchen sink the children were small both of them were in the kitchen and where our sink is you can look out across some acres in the back in a little pond and She's standing there staring out that window, and I, you know, I know preachers exaggerate, but I'm not exaggerating this one. Tears were dripping off her chin and splashing in the dishwater. I said, honey, what's wrong? She said, nothing's wrong. She said, God just gave me the most staggering revelation. She said, right now at this point in my life, in this season of my life, God has anointed me to be your wife, to raise these children. And she said, I just realized sitting here washing these dirty dishes with these babies around my legs. 
I'm worshiping God with every stroke as much as you with microphone and Bible. When are we ever going to get to that kind of a revelation? Where that everything we do is a worship to God. Remember, you're an original. You're not a duplicate. We are one body. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. One gift is no more important than any other, only different Position, write this down, position in the body of Christ is not based on status, but rather on service. I knew you wouldn't shout. We are one body with many members. Now, write this down. If you don't have a message Bible, buy one. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 14 to 24. Here's what your Bible says. I want you to think about how all of this that we've been discussing makes you more significant, not less. A body isn't just a single part blown up into something huge. It's all the different but similar parts arranged, functioning together. If foot said, I am not elegant like hand embellished with rings, I guess I don't belong to this body. Would that make it so? If the ear said, I'm not beautiful like the eye, limpid and expressive, I don't deserve a place on the head, would you want to remove it? If the body was all an eye, how could it hear? If it were an ear, how could it smell? As it is, we see that God has carefully placed each part of the body right where he wanted it. I wish I had time to give you the whole passage. That passage closes out with this question. If you had the choice between two, would you choose beautiful hair or good digestion? God's word is so practical. Which one would you choose? Because you don't see your digestive system work. But if it doesn't, your body's in trouble. Now we can shave your head and you'll be just fine. Isn't that right, Brother Murphy? Huh? Hallelujah. You'll be just fine. His body is strong and mighty and powerful. Now, we, we could put some, you know, extensions on him. But it wouldn't help him digest his food, would it? Amen. And that's the way the body is. You see people that parade across up here, and you think, isn't that something? That's just hair. Say, that's just hair. Now shout, I'm the belly. <laughs> you make the whole thing work. Without you, it doesn't work. Don't despise your gifts while you covet somebody else's gift. Celebrate your own gift. Rejoice in it and receive from other people's gifts. We're part of something far bigger than ourselves. 1 Corinthians 12, 19. Everything we've been talking about keeps your significance from being blown up into self-importance. For no matter how significant you are, it's only because of what you are a part of. Oh man, you don't even want to help me tonight. I said, I said no, no matter how great your gift is, your gift is only significant because of what it is a part of. When I came in tonight, I shook everybody's hand and everybody was well eager to shake my hand and I appreciate that, but I promise you, if I severed my hand from my body and threw it out there to you, you'd go, ah. 
Why? Because my hand is only significant because of what is attached to. And that's the way it is in the body of Christ. We only gain our significance as a result of what we are a part of. But can I tell you tonight, you ought to shout and sing and rejoice and dance for the grandeur and the greatness of that to which you are attached. The body of the living Christ. Shout, I'm a part of it. Oh, come on, shout, I'm a part of it. Be seated. There was something, there was something called Zionism. Zionism came into being as a result of Hitler's march through Europe where they were separated. The first banana to leave the bunch always gets skinned. The first thing that any adversary will do as I watch my dogs work at home, the first thing that they will do if there's a group of people, they're trained to segment those people away from one another. They will literally drive a crowd apart. Why? Because there's strength in that crowd. But if they can get you pushed over to the side, you're in bad trouble. Listen to me. The Jewish people were scattered in the dispersion. They were around the world and no nation to call their own. Elijah thought he was the only one left. The prophet Thought he'd been left alone. God showed up and said, I've got how many? 3,000? 7,000? I don't know everything, just something. I've got 7,000 left that have never bowed their knee to Baal. When you feel alone, you will surrender. So Zionism was born. And those Jewish people began to understand that they were a part of something bigger than you. And you know what their cry became? You may kill me, but you can't kill us. And if you can't kill us, then you can't kill me because I'm part of something way, way bigger than me. Are you in this building? Are you beginning to feel like you're a part of something way, 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 way bigger than you? Did you get anything? Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.